Okay, uh, so hello everyone, thanks for uh, coming. I also want to thank the Dean's Office for starting this series. Uh, someone who's always been very passionate about teaching and curriculum development and education. Sometimes at a top research university, it feels like that's not, that passion is not really particularly acknowledged, and so I think this series is a great way uh, of doing that. I'm also really excited to you know, meet some colleagues who share those passions. I'm pretty new to Columbia. I've been here less than a year, so uh, looking forward to making some connections. Um, right, so I've never given a talk quite like this before, so I struggled a little bit with, with what to put in it. And I started with kind of all the obvious things I could give a presentation on and started by rejecting them all. Um, but I'm, these are all things I'm happy to talk about in the Q&A or over coffee at some point in the, in the future. Um, so I could have talked about MOOCs, um, massive online courses. I was kind of part of the, one of the earliest generations of them. Uh, so I was at Stanford for about 15 years. Uh, Coursera, the online course platform, was founded by a couple of my then colleagues in 2011. And I jumped at the opportunity to adapt my algorithms class uh, to uh, the MOOC format. So there's been two MOOCs that have been running both on Coursera and on Stanford's sort of homebrewed platform since 2012. So they've been just running continuously for like seven years. Um, and they've engaged more than a million students. It's been kind of an amazing experience. So happy to tell you some stories from that. Um, another thing that I, I haven't done this at Columbia yet, but that I did at Stanford is, is uh, just sort of, you know, a DIY approach to putting my lectures up on YouTube. So I'd literally just have a TA with a camcorder and a tripod, and, you know, I'd be at the blackboard teaching math and this kind of stuff. And we'd literally just upload these 80-minute videos to YouTube, which, as was, you know, as was said, that's not the best format, and I was nervous it would be pointless. But um, that's also been a really good experience. I mean, it's definitely not as user-friendly as MOOCs, but I still, it feels like about a 100x increase in the audience, even for advanced classes. So if you have 20 students in your class, you know, the videos on, on YouTube, my sense is it reaches more like 2,000 people. Um, so that's been really interesting. The last thing I could have talked about, but I, I won't, is um, self-publishing slash publishing print on demand through platforms like Amazon uh, and Ingram. So I'm currently experimenting with that. I have a book series based on the MOOCs. Uh, I could have used a commercial publisher. I decided not to. I decided to self-publish instead. Um, the obvious con is that you don't have the promotional kind of machine of a commercial publisher, but the other hand, you have full control of everything. So in particular, I sell them super cheap, less than 20 bucks. All the other algorithms books, commercial publishers, they're 100 bucks or more. Right? So it's kind of a, kind of a big, big difference. All right. So I'm not going to talk about any of these, at least not in the main part. Uh, instead, I want to talk about theft. <laughs> uh, what do I mean? Uh, I'm referring to this famous quote of uh, Pablo Picasso, actually. Good artists borrow, great artists steal. Now, I am in no way comfortable calling myself a great artist, but I'm very happy to confess that I steal when it comes to, <laughs> when it comes to my teaching style. And, and initially, you know, I stole from who you'd think I'd steal from, you know, like my best professors that I had as an undergrad and as a PhD. You know, as I was a grad student, I'd watch the department colloquium every week. Whenever there was a particularly good talk, I would try to dissect it, say, you know, what was it that made it so, so good? Is that something I can copy? Is that not something I can copy? Um, as I've gotten older, I've actually started looking even broad, more broadly of things to steal from. So my current obsession is stand-up comedians. <laughs> Dave Chappelle, Wanda Sykes, Jared Carmichael. Actually, one thing that's been awesome about moving to New York is it's very easy to see stand-up live. But, you know, I also study the Netflix specials, especially these days for the use of rhetoric, the use of space, and of intonation, it's really, uh, they have amazing techniques, that some of, it, some of which I think is definitely stealable. So for today's talk, I, I decided to just come up with a few simple tricks uh, that I use in my classroom that perhaps, you know, some of you I'm sure already do them, but perhaps some of you will find something to steal. Okay. Uh, all right, so the first idea, teaching backwards. So let me, let me actually give you two points of background here. Point number one, so uh, I was an undergrad back in the mid-90s, and during that time, I was a college radio DJ. So every week, I'd spend three hours in a windowless basement room, a memorial auditorium at Stanford, playing CDs and playing you know, vinyl records. And like all DJs, I was totally obsessed with sequencing. Okay? Not just what songs will you play, but in what order and what will the segues be like between those songs. And to this day, that deeply influences how I think about my courses, both how I structure a single lecture and also how I structure the entire course. And so you'll see that in both of the first two, first two points. Second point of background, uh, when I was a first year assistant professor, uh, this was at Stanford in 2004, uh, I was assigned the undergraduate algorithms course. Okay? I had to teach that. Courses were not as big in 2004 as they are now, but back then at Stanford it still meant um, you know, something like a, 120 people. Because okay? it was required for all, everybody, all the, all the bachelor students, all the masters, all the PhDs, had to take this class. And moreover, it was the most advanced class that was required for all of the BS majors. Okay? 
Um, and so it was a little bit, I was pretty terrified, right? Because on the one hand, I felt like I was going to be facing an audience, most of whom didn't really want to be there or thought they didn't want to be there. Um, and secondly, you know, to teach algorithms well, and it's really the core of computer science, uh, you have to do some non-trivial math. There's really just sort of uh, no choice. And, um, and I really feel like to this day, my, a lot of aspects of my teaching style were sort of forged in the crucible of teaching that difficult required class back, back in, my, in my first year. And in particular, I sort of developed this mindset of kind of always needing to justify my existence. So, um, you know, so in, uh, you can't teach this course without causing some pain to students doing some math. But so I just, I aspired to always before the pain was felt, it was crystal clear, you know, why it needed to be endured and what would be the payoff of, of doing so. So in other words, you know, math as a necessary evil en route to something which is obviously interesting to all computer scientists, like say the running time of some super cool algorithm like Quicksort. Okay? So that's, those are all points of background into, into teaching backward. Backward with respect to, you know, if you open up, so you're going to teach sort of mathematical stuff. Um, so I'm, I'm comparing to say how a math book is typically written or a theoretical computer science book is typically written. And in my experience, if you randomly sample such a book, it looks like the main goal of the author was to avoid offending their friends who are also professional mathematicians, as opposed to thinking about the student experience. So for example, like a cardinal rule, right, in a math book is never use a term before it's defined. Maybe a good idea for a book. Even there, I think it's debatable, but definitely a rule that should be broken in the classroom, in my experience. So again, as far as the ordering, of course you can't prove something before you've stated the theorem. That doesn't make any sense. Uh, and then usually, you know, you, you go through a whole bunch of foundations, and then once you've mastered all the foundations, at that point, hopefully, there's a chapter on the applications, putting them to use. And so I said I'm obsessed with sequencing, so literally within a lecture, whenever I have, you know, a sequence of things like this to discuss, I always do a thought experiment, would it be better for the students to do it in some other order? Like, for example, just in reverse. For the first one, I think it's almost always a good idea, actually. So before introducing a mathematical definition, introduce things that are going to satisfy the definition, also introduce things that are not going to satisfy the definition. Students can then understand the definition as a natural extrapolation of the examples. Again, I found this almost always improves lecture uh, when I do this. And when I first started doing it, it sort of felt like a sleight of hand, like it was just some cheat code that I discovered. You know, but then as I got older, I realized, you know, you talk to people who do math for a living, this is actually how they think about definitions anyways. They do not think about the statement, usually. They think about what they're intended to include and exclude. So this even feels more faithful to the practice of kind of doing mathematics. All right, this next one is not, it's not always a good idea to reverse it, but sometimes it is, maybe 50-50. Um, so sometimes what you've been discussing already naturally leads into a proof. Maybe you've done an example and you just say, what would a general version of this argument look like? And you start you know, trying to generalize it. All of a sudden you say you need hypothesis A for this step, hypothesis B for this step. You, you finish, you're like, oh, okay, what did we just prove? And then out falls the theorem statement. Okay, some of the times that, that works out too. Um, and then like I was saying, sort of math is a necessary evil. Uh, I always start with the application and then you know, when we, ha we have no choice but to do some theory, at that point, we do the theory. So I know this is all kind of abstract, so let me just show you kind of concretely, especially sort of this last point, how this would play out in one of my courses. Okay, so the next two slides are stolen from, they're literally the very beginning of my undergrad algorithms course. So these are from literally the first 10 minute video of the first of the two MOOCs, where I'm telling, you know, just sort of giving people a feel for algorithms and reminding people that everybody learned algorithms as a kid. Like in fifth grade, when you learn to just take the product of two numbers, right, a bunch of partial products and sum up the results. And in algorithms, in undergrad algorithms, what we really focus on is whether algorithms are fast or slow. In computer science, we usually care about big problems. So actually, we really focus on the scaling behavior of algorithms. So as the input grows larger, how much more time does it take for your algorithm to solve the problem? Okay? And if you stare at the fifth grade integer multiplication algorithm, you, know, you sort of see that there's this kind of, you know, if the digits had n numbers, you have to fill out this roughly n by n table. And indeed, the number of operations for the fifth grade algorithm grows as a quadratic function of the number of digits in the integers. Okay? So in particular, if you, if, you, if you wanted to look at numbers that were twice as long, the number of operations would grow by a factor of four. Okay? Because you have this quadratic dependence. All right, so you know, something you probably didn't think about in fifth grade is whether there might be an algorithm better than this one, meaning faster, meaning scaling more slowly with the input size. Uh, and it turns out there are such algorithms. 
Uh, and the first one you learn is something called Kiritsuba multiplication. It is not important today that you sort of understand how this works. That's not the point. Um, I will just say for those of you that know a little programming, so it's a recursive algorithm, meaning you call, it calls itself on smaller inputs with sort of fewer numbers. Uh, the most straightforward way to solve integer multiplication recursively arises you have to make four recursive calls, solve four subproblems. Karatsuba noticed a very simple trick where you can reduce the number of recursive calls from four to three. Okay, which surely speeds up the algorithm, but the question is, by how much? Okay? So at this point, the, just the question is, does this crazy recursive algorithm you know, that I've just explained, does it beat what you did in fifth grade or not? Okay? And generally, everybody's pretty interested in that. And it's also clear you're going to have to do math to answer the question, because figuring out the running time of recursive algorithms is, different, is difficult. They spawn a bunch of copies of themselves, and you have to keep track of all of the work being done in all of the different recursive calls. So it's kind of obvious you're going to need some math. Then later in the course, you do something known as the master method, which is the sort of you know, powerful theorem for analyzing recursive algorithms like this. And already before you even start that, everybody sort of is wondering what actually is the running time of this. And maybe, maybe you do a little bit of a spoiler alert and you promise them it's gonna, it is gonna be better than the fifth grade uh, algorithm. The exact answer turns out to be it scales as n to the log base two of three, n to the roughly 1.57, for those of you interested, okay? So that's an example of how you know, I really start with the application before I move on, move on to the math. All right, so um, two other ideas, and I'll, I'll be quick with each of these. Um, so idea one, so when, you have a, you know, when you're doing a, a, a three-hour uh, DJ set, uh, one thing you always want to avoid doing is having a, a part that drags. Okay, so there should be sort of a, a nice narrative arc. There's, there's going to be crescendos and climaxes and ebbs and flows, all sorts of things. Another analogy, which especially in the last decade I've really liked, is television series. Right? So the good ones, which you, know, you have a long narrative arc spanning sort of multiple seasons. You know, I think of a course sort of as like a season, individual lectures sort of, a, sort of as like episodes. Um, it's another analogy I like. And uh, TV shows also, you don't want to drag. Okay, you've got to maintain momentum. And in my experience, this is a pretty big factor of student engagement. Does it feel like you're on a crescendo building towards some climax, which is going to be, which is going to be worthwhile at the end of the day? All right, so how, so, you know, I, I'm still trying to think about how to best convey a sense of momentum. But let me just tell you one thing that I always do, which is I try to let the length that I have in mind dictate the material, not the other way around. Okay, so I don't say I'm going to teach chapter four of this textbook, however long it takes. I say I'm going to teach topic X in this class. How much patience do I think the students have for topic X, assuming I give really good lectures? Okay. And the answer is generally going to be, you know, it might be like, say, two lectures, okay? one week, two and a half hours. And then I take that as a hard constraint. There's more than two and a half hours worth of stuff I'd like to say about topic X, but I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to curate their experience. What is the best two and a half hours on topic X I could possibly tell them? That would be the most useful later. This is hard because it forces you to make tough decisions kind of all along the way. But I think they're good tough decisions. Right? So they're really forcing you to decide what to omit, right? to curate. But if you think about it, like, you know, what do you want an expert Columbia professor for, if not, to kind of curate exactly which parts of the subject uh, you're going to learn? Okay. Um, good. Now, so you can't, right, you can't be in a crescendo for 14 straight weeks, right? That doesn't work. You can't, you can't be in a crescendo for a three-hour DJ set either. So there have to be ebbs and flows, right? There have to be, so I, I like to think about sort of alternating this crescendo to a climax followed by an interlude. And this, I mean this both at the time scale of within a single lecture and also across the entire course. Um, and so within a lecture, this ties in nicely to the discussions we were having about sort of tidbits of active learning and that kind of thing. So, you know, if I finish a hard proof, say it was like a 20-minute proof or something, we finally finish it, I mean, I, I find some excuse to have the students rest for five minutes, right? And so if I can't think of anything else, it's just a stretch break. Better would be, you know, something about active learning. Uh, or, you know, maybe I, you know, I could tell them some historical context about, you know, what was going on at the time of this theorem. Um, maybe, you know, I can tell them some biographical facts about the people who proved it. Maybe I even know the people who proved it. You know, maybe I know some sort of war stories from the trenches, you know, an industry of people who have used this or related statements. Anything, really almost any excuse to give the students a chance to regroup so you can start on the crescendo again. Okay. So that brings me to the last idea, which is yet another thing, um, uh, yet another type of interlude that I like to use. And again, this will echo um, some of the things that Katie said. Uh, which is, do not be afraid of exposing your course's logic explicitly to the students. In other words, give them some insight. Give them a view under the hood a little bit into the process of putting the course together or putting the various 
lectures together, the struggles you had, the design decisions you faced, uh, et cetera, what your teaching philosophy is. Uh, if nothing else, the students are going to be reassured to hear that you have a teaching philosophy <laughs> and that you actually thought about difficult decisions putting the course together. And again, echoing something that Katie said, I, I find that actually these interludes, I think it closes the gap between the students and the instructor. I think it makes it more clear it's kind of a cooperative uh, endeavor, right, rather than an antagonistic one, okay, when you open up, the, open up the box like this a little bit. Let me just give you one concrete example, like one interlude I like to use. I like to talk about the following completely stupid <laughs> trivial equation. Uh, I tell students that what, the amount that they get out of the class, right, is going to be the amount of time they put into it <laughs> times the rate of learning. Okay? <laughs> totally stupid equation. But here's the, here's the point of this factorization. I tell them, this term, this is my job. My job is to make this as high as possible. My goal is to make this higher than it's ever been for any course you've ever taken. Probably I won't succeed, but that's my aspiration point. And then I say, ball's in your court, guys. This term, that's you. I have no control over it, okay? You, cho you choose how much you want to spend, or equivalently, how you choose how much you want to learn in this course. So uh, those are the three tricks. So I'll stop there. <laughs>